Hey folks, welcome. Uh, today we've got a special guest with us, Connor from Dotware Games. Connor, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking about all things kind of like Unreal Engine, Vs a V, immersive developers getting involved. But I'd love if you could tell the audience uh, just a little bit about yourself and your kind of history using Unreal Engine. Hey everybody. So uh, yeah, my name is Connor. Uh, I am the owner and director of a Las Vegas-based game development studio called Dotware Games. And I've been in Unreal Engine pretty much every day for the last seven years. There were a few, few, a few weekends where maybe I took a day or two off. But uh, I do uh, contract work, development work, and I train people in Unreal Engine. So at this point, I've trained over 3,000 people how to use Unreal Engine across various workshops, online events, and in-person classes. And uh, I love Unreal. Uh, it is an extraordinary piece of software that the world has just started to realize mm -hmm. is so applicable beyond just strictly the confines of games. So that's why we've connected to talk about Unreal Engine for the touch designer community. And while I'm no expert uh, on stage live events and that kind of thing, um, I am in the general use of the software and some really specific deep topics and conceptual topics about how to use the Unreal Engine. So we wanted to get together and hopefully this could be useful to uh, this community. Yeah, put together a nice old mind meld. Um, so yeah. there's one topic I thought would be a great one to start with, which is one that confuses me to this day, which is probably actually gonna be most of the topics today, but um, it's kind of this idea of the player controller in Unreal. Because mm -hmm. I think conceptually, this concept of a player controller is foreign to most immersive developers and what we're kind of used to in our pipelines, you know, coming from like touch designers, Notch and all these other applications. There's no real player controller that's separate from you in the editor. Uh, you know, in some apps, maybe you just choose the camera to look through. That might be like the closest parallel I could draw to like a player controller uh, type of setup from another application. So I think this becomes real confusing for new users, myself um, specifically conceptually on the one hand, but also practically because it's one of those idiosyncrasies of Unreal that you start to pick up, which is that you know, you can't really see the player controller in or the player in the outliner until you hit play. And then all of a sudden these things spawn. But as you're a new developer, you kind of learn that, oh, you don't want to edit things while the game is running because then the changes don't save. So I'd love if you could kind of help talk me through uh, and the audience through like conceptually, what is this idea of a player controller? Uh, how does it relate to your development experience inside of Unreal? Uh, and then after, maybe we can look at some some quick tips that you might have around player controllers for, for new developers. So the best way to look at the player controller in Unreal Engine is the player controller is your users or your players' soul, okay? Hmm. In Unreal, you can control different characters or even more fundamentally than that, we call them pawns. That's what Unreal calls it. A pawn, a character is generally the same thing. It's something that can be controlled. So let's say you've got some application like Grand Theft Auto, okay? When I'm running around as a person in third-person character, I am a player control. There's a player controller controlling this third-person character. But then I get into a car, and now I'm controlling a car. The car is a completely different character, this thing called Car Pawn. And now the character I'm playing, the pawn, is the car, not the third-person character. Mm -hmm. And then I get into an airplane. Okay, now I'm flying this airplane around Grand Theft Auto. That airplane is, again, its own pawn. But the thing that doesn't change the entire time is this player controller thing. Okay, There's only one of them. It's the soul that possesses different controllable characters, Okay, or what we call pawns, same thing. So um, why do we even have this as a setting fundamentally? Well, it's really useful because you know fundamentally that as soon as you hit that play button, you are always this particular player controller. So you could put lots of universal code on the player controller. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm only have certain types of code on my car that has to do with driving and other types of car uh, code on my character that's to do with being a third person character, maybe picking up inventory items, that kind of thing. So what is the thing that does not change player controller? So example, I've used player controllers to put uh, code on there that I want to always be running or always have access to is really fundamental to the player's experience, no matter what pawn they might be possessing. So for example, I've got a gamepad controller here. Okay, uh, On the player controller, since again, it never goes away, your player always is in that player controller, I can program uh, detecting whether they're using a gamepad or not. Mm -hmm. And if suddenly they press a keyboard key or move a mouse, 
all of a sudden I want to change all the icons in the game to be mouse and keyboard, but then they move a button here back to gamepad. A great place for that, the best place for detecting that would be, for example, the player controller, because that is agnostic to the particular pawn or character that you're playing. Um, would you say if uh, I want to jump in because I, I thought it was yeah. an interesting parallel just came to mind back from I would say what, what must have been like in the 2000s era of web development when MVC model view control became like this huge paradigm for all mm -hmm. these like live JavaScript app building frameworks for web where I th if I'm understanding correct that might be like a really good analogy for people coming from like a development background where Previous to that, I think things worked a little bit more like touch designer where like the code and the logic for your database and your data sets were all like literally sitting right next to or intertwined with uh, the code for visualizing things, which was right there intertwined with the code for uh, the control mechanisms that then maybe control and, and puppet some of the stuff that's happening. And that whole thing with the website of things was like, hey, let's split these three pieces of code so that way, if one of the modules kind of fundamentally changes, which I think that's the example you're mentioning where you have this kind of player controller object. I think that reference of the soul is pretty interesting because it, it's basically like user inputs come to this player controller. This is where you do a lot of your logic for the user inputs abstracted away from maybe specifically what it's controlling, which then gives you the ability, like you're saying, oh, you know, your car in GTA could be now the the model you're controlling or a person from third person, or you go into first person, but fundamentally it kind of helps you separate that kind of like, uh, I, I guess it's also called a separation of concerns in like software development mm -hmm. sometimes. Yeah, it's all about that concept of object oriented programming. Mm -hmm. So your code has to live somewhere and it, that matters because it helps really substantially um, develop out the architecture through which things you know, are appropriate. So like, like I said, you know, the, the car code to do with braking and accelerating that, that should live on this particular piece of code or what we call a coded object or in Unreal, we call a blueprint. So mm -hmm. people in the touch designer community are familiar with blueprints and blueprint, the visual yeah. scripting system, and maybe making blueprints in your content browser and opening them up and then, and then, you know, editing existing ones. Well, that's all that that is. These are specific coded objects code that's applicable lives there. So back to this idea of the player controller, you know, another example popped in my head, something like, and this is true of any application besides just a game, you need to pause, you need a pause menu. You know, you mm -hmm. need to let the player stop the application to, to quit or to, to reload or do something. That's another great uh, uh, use of the player controller. Because again, you could have these different game modes. Maybe you have a pawn that lets you, you know, walk around some live set, set or some archivist thing, but then you have another pawn that lets you fly around and place things out, whatever. Those are different pawns, player controller. You're going to want to be able to pause any point from that. So that's an example of where you do the player controller. In terms of, yeah, the analogy of the soul, it really is helpful in learning, not, not just, uh, just understanding it conceptually, but even the nodes for changing pawns, mm. it's called possess. So oh, interesting. I, oh, that's great. Yeah. So Unreal Engine is a world it believes in our reincarnation when you're yeah. in Unreal. So you know you are one soul, but you can possess many incarnations, mm -hmm. aka pawns. And I guess that's kind of the the big takeaway here. I think, and especially I, I love that you brought up like object oriented programming is that. We do some of that stuff traditionally on like the touch designer side, but because our environment is a bit more like flat, for lack of a better term, I think that's also a, a, a little tricky part when people come into Unreal. I know my first kind of experiences was, hey, let me make one blueprint and put all of my <laughs> whole app's logic in like a blueprint because that's what I'm used to. Whereas player controllers and, and some of the other stuff we're going to talk about, I think highlight the more cohesion toward the standards of object-oriented programming, like, hey, let's break up our code into chunks where those chunks like the player controller, maybe stuff about game modes or state of the game and all these kind of things are just inherently separate by default. And don't worry, you'll get used to it because it's, it's kind of just real like tr traditional object-oriented programming. Would that be like a it fair breakdown? Absolutely. But the whole point of this kind of breakdown, this higher level mm -hmm. is it should be there to serve you. You know, you've got a deadline on Monday. 
that's fine. Don't, don't worry. Don't, you don't have to deal with necessarily player controllers and, and different and understanding these high level concepts. You could put it, like you said, when people are starting out all in one blueprint. And if you're going to do that, if you're starting on Unreal, do it on the level blueprint. Do it oh, on the level blueprint because the level blueprint has access to everything. So actually, I'm showing you my screen right now. I just want to show mm. this. So uh, we're, we're in this uh, blank project. You know, I just selected one of the examples. And so um, right now, if I were to hit play, there's kind of nothing going on. I'm basically this flying pawn that mm -hmm. uh, Unreal gives us. Um, but let's say I wanted to code something to happen. I, I don't know. In this case, uh, I'm, I'm just going to make like a piece of simple code. I'll go ahead and bring out this cube here. And we're just going to you know, increase the size of the cube if I press a certain key. You know, oh, C Connor, you put this on the player controller? What if I want to increase the size of the cube when I'm you know, flying in my rocket ship pond or whatever it might be? We don't need to worry about that. Because again, if you're starting out or you, know, you got a deadline, there's nothing wrong with going here and then doing your code on the level blueprint. Oh, okay? interesting. This is something, yeah, this is something you want to graduate out of eventually. You know, that object-oriented programming, building proper architecture, it is for sure there to serve you. So I don't use the level blueprint too often, not all the time, but like I said, there's nothing wrong. If you are gonna put all your code in one spot, generally speaking, this along with whatever your character, your pawn is, um, might be the way to do it. Uh, and here's why. So the level blueprint can take in input events. So I could start up, look, you know, straight up, look up, I don't know, the J key. So I got all the keyboard events. Okay, oh, cool, awesome. I got the J key. And then what's really useful is anything, anything literally in this level I have access to via the it's, level. It's blueprint. in your scope from the level blueprint, it, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. in your scope. Uh, so anything in this level you can see, or in the world outliner, because the world outliner is just a list of everything in the level. So you can see cube, cube. I can simply go to the level blueprint, right click, and I don't have to search anything. At the very top, it's going to say create a reference to. And so now I have a reference to it, and I can access all of its properties. Okay, mm -hmm. Anything you see in the details panel of something selected, those are its properties. So I could change the mesh. I could change the material. I could change the scale, the rotation, whatever. I said I'd make it bigger, so I'll just set the scale or whatever. OK, set actor scale to, I don't know, 11 times its normal size. And so if I were to hit play, and I'm running in Unreal Engine, and here I am flying around, and I press the J key, J. It just increased. So awesome. that's a quick and dirty yeah. way of getting stuff done in Unreal. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Just as you do get better at the engine and you're starting to familiarize yourself with player controllers and stuff, you, you will want to understand that. And there's one, one breakdown of that. Mm -hmm. Your player controller and your play modes and stuff are going to be here in world settings. So if I go to world settings, uh, what I can do is scroll down to where you see game mode override and then selected game mode. Now this stuff is gonna come from your project settings, but you can override that for a particular level. Uh, so if I were to click the drop down here, you can see I've got different game modes. And you know, I know you wanted to ask some questions mm -hmm. on game modes, this might be something you can maybe key me up for, and then I can go specific into uh, different topic areas. Absolutely. And I think that gives us a great idea of the player controller. If I was going to summarize that in like one sentence for myself, yep. I would say like that idea of it's essentially where ideally you would put the code and logic around the inputs that a user is going to have into your application in a way that's abstracted so that you know, whether it's processing them, cleaning them up, doing whatever with them, that then they'll go on to trigger other events in kind of the, the project. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, folks, thanks for watching. If you like our YouTube content, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. The HQ Pro is the only comprehensive educational resource and community for immersive design, touch designer, and creative tech pros. In the HQ Pro trainings, we cover almost any topic you can think of, and we go way more in depth than we do in our YouTube tutorials. We have a private group where Matthew Reagan, myself, and our other industry veteran and pioneer teachers answer your questions every single day. If that sounds cool, click the link in the description to learn more. And if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button, and don't forget to subscribe for more free touch designer and immersive content.